So I'm here with Rich Bachman, senior reporter, and Rich has a pretty amazing scoop today about Carlyle, which is a private equity giant that has quietly, very quietly become what we're calling the king of the Brooklyn walk-up scene. So Rich, uh, just set the scene for us with this story. What has Carlyle done in New York? What is what is this about? What's your story about? Uh, Carlyle has targeted a very niche kind of asset and one that uh, we don't associate with big private equity firms. They're small walk-up buildings in Brooklyn. They're fewer than 10 units a piece. And uh, they're what's known as 2A, 2B, which is a tax class. And it limits the uh, increase on real estate taxes to 8% each year. Uh, so as I say, it's a very niche, uh, small asset uh, for something like you know, a huge private equity firm to talk yeah, about. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because typically, to your point, like a Blackstone or a Carlisle or a KKR is going to go and buy a giant, if they're into the multifamily space, they'll go buy a big rental tower for $500 million, a billion dollars even, right? In this case, what is the individual transaction size for some of the stuff you were looking at? They're about like two, three million dollars a piece. And uh, in December, Carlisle just closed an eight billion dollar real estate <laughs> fund. So you can imagine like to get that money out, uh, you know, how many of these small deals they have to do. Yeah. And so what's the mechanism that they've used for this? Um, so they have, um, as I understand it, several uh, partners, operators that they've backed. Mm -hmm. One of them, as we highlight in the story, is uh, Greenbrook Partners. Uh, and they've uh, teamed up on a portfolio of about 45 buildings with them. Um, but they also have their own like boots on the ground going out and buying up buildings, sometimes one at a time, sometimes, you know, two or three from, you know, the same buyer, uh, same mm -hmm. seller. Um, but yeah, you know, in addition to partnering with other operators, they're going out and they're buying $2 million buildings. That's incredible. And so... For someone like Carlisle to do this, uh, I mean, their scale is still their goal, but they're just getting at it. I think the illustration we have in the story is these little buildings being tossed into a giant pile. And so far, but the real number is probably even higher, but you've tracked down at least half a billion dollars worth of purchases in the Brooklyn market. So that's significant. Can we talk for a second about what that could mean for the actual tenants in the space and for other mom and pop landlords, let's say? Yeah, you know, um, I spoke with some of the other landlords in there um, and I asked them, you know, what they made of this and they thought that it was encouraging to see that institutional capital come in and sort of validate, you know, what they do. Um, it's such a large and fragmented market that I don't know that like someone like Carlisle moving in really puts a lot of like pricing pressure on, you know, their competitors. Mm -hmm. I, I think that... Um, it's still sort of an open market for everyone, you know, uh, to go about there. Um, and for the tenants? For tenants, uh, you know, these are market rate buildings. To be clear, these aren't these aren't subject to the rent stabilization laws, which has decimated what the book looks like for a lot of real estate players, right? So these are market rate tenants. You can kind of do what you please. Right. Generally, these smaller buildings tend to be more market rate. You know, there are some, you know, it's a mix, but I'm told that Carlisle is specifically targeting market rate only, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and they're at the whim of, you know, the free market. Um, we saw some controversy uh, last year with Greenbrook uh, when they were declining to renew some leases for market rate tenants. And that got, um, you know, local politicians, uh, Brad Lander, the local city council member, Senator Chuck Schumer, you know, coming in and crying foul. And so uh, is the fear that, you know, someone like Carlisle might go and jack up the rents when the, when the lease runs, you know, rolls over? Is that the idea? It could be that or that they look to, uh, you know, make improvements to the building, which would yeah. say, say, you know, just sort of clearing it out, which, you know, with, again, with market rate tenants, they can just decide to do. There are no protections in place there. And it's a fascinating story. Maybe we should just end with uh, why private equity would be going for such buildings. Like, that's a lot of money. Like, they generally are writing very big checks. So why, do you think this is a trend that we're going to see other players come into this space as well? It's hard to say, you know, whether others will follow them. Certainly the 2019 rent laws have changed the calculus on buying, you know, larger buildings that have a large 
uh, rent stabilized component to them. And people are looking for free market ones. And, um, you know, they are high yielding properties. They're low operation costs. You can still take advantage of um, the high margin, sorry, uh, of um, the uh, raise in rents. Um, you just have to build a very large portfolio to get to the scale that you want to make it make sense. And that's what you've sort of been tracking. So great story, Rich. Thanks again. Cool. Thank you.